not one memory that's most enduring of my granny, but 28 years of me pushing my face into the cashmere on her chest, putting my arms around her giant waist, smelling Chanel number no. five mixed with mothballs, <laughs> and feeling the rumble in my whole body when she would talk, or when she would laugh, or when she'd do her favorite thing, which was to sing. Выходила на берег Катюша, на высокий берег на крутой. And as warm and as soft and as kind as she was, she could be cold and hard and fierce if we did something that we weren't supposed to do. My mom was away a lot when I was a kid, and my dad lived my whole life in Russia, and so my granny pretty much brought my brother and I up. And there would be nights when I would come home and then be walked backwards down the corridor with her, about half my size, hitting me on either <laughs> arm, saying, Masha, I told you, you have to be home before it got dark. I will get my back and hit you with <laughs> She never did hit us with a belt, <laughs> but the threat of it was enough to keep us mostly in line. Except sometimes it was quite hard to know how to do that because of her logic. We moved. <laughs> Eventually, my mum, my brother and I moved five minutes down the road, and um, my mum sometimes would get a phone call at two o'clock in the morning, and she would say, where is Marsha? And my mum would say, she's at home. She's been at home all evening. And she'd say, I understand that Marsha is pregnant. <laughs> and my mum would say, and your evidence is, that she would solemnly say, Marsha was doing homework in the same room as her boyfriend was mending bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually she started to really um, sort of dissolve into senile dementia. It was as soon as my grandpa died, it felt like she just, it wasn't that she was doing it through grief, she was just kind of doing it because she could. She didn't have to like keep it together <laughs> And I think with senile dementia, I know it can be really sad for a lot of people. If you are put in an institution and you're surrounded by strangers and you're confused, it can be really scary. But with her, we kept her at home. We had a series of Russian illegal immigrants that we were happy to pay money to look after her. They needed a job and we needed someone who spoke Russian who could be around. And I think that when you have seen our dementia, it's a lot like being a two-year-old, where whatever is around you is your only reality. So if everyone's standing around wringing their hands and going, oh no, then you'll think things are really bad. <laughs> Whereas if you're doing what we would do, which is that one person will go, quick everyone, Granny tried to make tea using cat food. And we'll <laughs> run into the kitchen and start laughing. <laughs> Then I think you think, well, clearly something is hilarious. <laughs> Probably it's me, because I'm a bit of a comedian. <laughs> and it wasn't that we were laughing. Well, we kind of were laughing at her. But we were doing it with love and with affection. Yeah. And she was so funny. She went through this amazing phase where she would blend fiction and reality. So we'd be watching TV with her. I'd be sitting watching, like, uh, Jerry Springer. And she would start telling me his entire backstory <laughs> that she truly really believed. She'd be like, but you must understand, Marcia, is that when he was a little boy, originally he lived in Russia. <laughs> and all, all of the girls in the village were in Russia. <laughs> but you see, he moved to America when he was still quite young, which is why he does not have accent. <laughs> One time she and I were sitting watching Diagnosis Murder with Dick Van Dyke, um, which is a, sort of, you know, that cop show, and she was very heavily involved in this murder and was asking me all of these questions that I literally could only have answered if I'd actually been on Dick Van Dyke's. <laughs> Um, and then eventually she needed to go to the toilet and she um, said so in spite of being so short she was very round lady and it was quite hard to get her um, up and down and so we had a commode which is one of those like old fashioned it's kind of like a big wooden chair and then you lift up the seat and there's a little potty inside it so I you know picked her up and put her on the pot which is sort of this ideal you have to ordeal rather um, you know, take down her clothes and sit her down, and, and then she'd done a poo, which, you know, wiped her, and it's a bit gross, but we do it for love. And <laughs> afterwards, I, you know, cleaned her up and got her dressed and sat her back down, and then I took the pot full of her poo and uh, went to throw it away, and, and she 
put one of her tiny hands on my arm and with the other with a slender finger pointed inside the palms of Marsha. Make sure that you do not remove this. <laughs> because they will need to examine it for evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and then she started to really slow down, and she stopped taking pleasure in things. She stopped enjoying watching TV. She stopped taking pleasure in the cat. We had this little black with some white bits cat called Mimi, who was terrified of everyone except for my granny. And she stopped taking pleasure in her, she stopped taking pleasure in food. And you'd come in and kiss her and we'd go, granny, granny, granny. And at best she'd just kind of look up gormously. And so when I got the phone call from my mum saying the doctor's been, he says maybe she'll last a few more days, maybe she won't, but this is probably the end. I was kind of surprised by how surprised I was. I remember standing at London Bridge Station and feeling like the platform was falling away from me. Because this wasn't just the little granny of the last few months, this was all my grannies. This was the granny whose knee I sat on when I was four, and the granny who would tell me off when I was 14, and the granny who I would sit and watch TV with when I was 24. And the other thing that I felt was just this anger, but like, a, in a petulant way, like a teenager, I felt like, but I don't want her to die. She doesn't have to die. Why? It's not fair. And she was 97. She was going to at some point. So I went home, and just after I got there, the priests got there. And I don't know if you've ever seen a Russian priest before, but they have these kind of tall pillar box black hats, long white beard, long black robes down to the ground. As soon as they came, came in, Mimi, the cat, just ran up to them and started rubbing herself on their legs. I feel like she like, recognised her right. <laughs> <laughs> and so they came in, and we prayed, and we cried. And then after they left, my mum and my uncle Andrew and I all put mattresses down on the floor of her bedroom so that we could sleep in the same room as her. Except I couldn't sleep, because I kept thinking, what if she dies and we're not there? And I knew that ultimately it didn't really matter, but we'd been there when my grandpa had died, and we'd been there when my uncle Boris had died, and I didn't want her to have to go through that on her own. So I climbed up into the bed next to her, put one hand of mine on her shoulder, which was bony by now and trembling, and the other arm I put round her and she grabbed my hand in her tiny one. And we slept like that for a couple of hours. And then I woke up, and then my mum woke up, and then she woke up. And we had a sponge that we would take and dip in water and give to her, because that was the only way that she could drink. And she hadn't spoken in weeks, and she hadn't said anything that made any sense in months, but she said, spice you, which means thank you. And she said, Daragaya, which means my beloved. And then she did something she hadn't done in years, while she was lying there. The next morning, it was Friday, and we managed to get in touch with my brother who lives in Thailand, and he said, I can't get back before Tuesday. And we said, well, we're all here, you'll be home for the funeral. As Russians, we keep the body in the house for three days afterwards, so we knew that he would still get to see her. But Friday came and went, and Saturday came and went, and Sunday came and went, and most of the time she was either asleep or unconscious, so she didn't seem to be in terrible pain. And the times when we weren't sitting holding her little hand and crying or holding each other and crying, it kind of felt like Christmas. Because we would just, you know, we didn't get dressed for most of the day. We'd just sit around in our pajamas, reading magazines. We'd have these long lunches. People would come over and they'd bring food and sometimes they'd bring presents. One friend brought me some socks. <laughs> Another friend was a journalist, and she'd been on a panel that day with um, one of the actors from the TV sitcom Red Dwarf, which is one of my favourite shows in the whole world. <laughs> and she usually has a lot of integrity about like I wouldn't want compromise my journalistic. Uh, but she asked him for an autograph. Yeah. <laughs> so I still have from Craig Charles. It says, "Kisses me strong." <laughs> And then Monday came and went, and on Tuesday, 
At 10.30 in the morning, my brother arrived. And my granny hadn't recognized that anyone was in the room for such a long time. She hadn't recognized any of us, even longer. But at 11.15, my mom called us into her room and said, this is it. And so we stood with my mom and I holding one of her little hands, and my uncle and my brother holding her other little hand. And I don't know if you've ever been there when someone is dying. I am lucky enough, and I do feel like it's lucky, to have been there with three people when they're dying. And one of the ways that you know is that they have this very particular way of breathing. My uncle was saying the Lord's Prayer to her, and he was saying it in Russian. He grew up in England, and it's not a language that comes very naturally to him, but it was the language that she grew up with, and it's the softest of all the languages she spoke. Ochinash. And we looked at each other crying and nodding. And we called my uncle from his prayer. And then suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of the funniest moments of my life. <laughs> she carried on for about a minute. And then after that, she stopped for good. And that's how my granny had the best death she could have possibly had. Thank you. <laughs>